Okay, so today's talk is about um, working with emotions, uh, especially strong emotions, which I think is actually a really important um, topic um, that Buddhists don't always do very well. Um, and if you have a comment or something or some burning thing, you can always put it in the chat bar. Um, okay, yeah, so basically, um, you know, in Buddhism, it's, it's kind of important to know how to put the teachings in, into perspective because we have these kind of ultimate level teachings where we talk about emptiness and we talk about selflessness and we talk about everybody is good from the very beginning. Our innate, in our innate nature is peace and joy and luminous awareness. And, you know, thoughts and feelings are impermanent and adventitious and they don't last. So don't pay too much attention to them. Somebody just told me they're having technical difficulties. So don't worry if they drop in and out. Um, but when you hear these ultimate teachings, you can kind of start to think, well, Maybe emotions don't matter. Maybe I should just bliss out and I should just focus on my transcendent nature and my Buddha nature and everything's emptiness anyway and everything's impermanent. So these things don't matter. Um, but that can be very problematic because we live in the relative world and most of us are not enlightened and are not likely to get enlightened anytime soon. Enlightenment is like a long-term <laughs> long goal. you know. So it's really important to... Um, I mean, not to say that you can't get enlightened if you don't make a lot of effort. It's great. But enlightenment is an incremental process, you know, and we live in the relative world. So it's it's really important to understand when someone is talking about something ultimate um, to not deny relative existence and the relative world and the importance of dealing with emotions, having healthy relationships, having a, um, a basic standard of living. Uh, you know, enough food to eat, education, a, a good political system, you know, nobody can thrive in a society where people are starving and there is war and there is a dictatorship and women are oppressed or people of colour are marginalised and people live in fear. You know, those, those problems are definitely going to impact the well-being of everyone and the potential of everyone to seek liberation. Um, and, you know, I think when we read the Buddhist teachings about emotion, it can be quite, um, it's quite intellectual and, uh, dare I say it, pretty much written from a male point of view because the teachings were, you know, mostly passed down by males. Um, and sometimes they kind of denigrate the lived experience of women every day, like, and they kind of oh yeah, like being at home with the kids is very samsaric, very worldly. It's not, um, you're not a, a meditator on a mountain and somehow that's less important and less profound. But actually that's not how most people live. Most people don't live in a cave in the Himalayas. You know, most people do have jobs, do have families, do have relationships. So um, we have to learn to appreciate and respect the lived experience of most lay Buddhists and relate the Dharma, understand the Dharma, how, uh, how they can practice it, you know, and not patronize them. Um, because <laughs> motherhood is like one of, and fatherhood is one of the most important jobs. Like without a mother and a father, none of us would be here. And the early childhood emotional neural pathways that are laid down, um, basically set someone's, uh, ability to be a member of society for the rest of their lives. So that's actually one of the most important jobs. Um, and when you hear about Buddhist teachings, you know, you'll see the wheel of life and you'll see the three animals in the center of the wheel of life, you know, the, the rooster, the snake and the pig, and, and they represent uh, greed, grasping, um, aversion or anger and ignorance and you just kind of start to, and, and then, you know, all the negative emotions start from there. And then they talk about how negative emotions arise based on ignorance, based on self grasping, based on misapprehending um, your existence and thinking that you have a permanent lasting self that's separate from everything else. So, so from the very beginning in Buddhism, there is this kind of subtle uh, inference that emotions are negative and deluded <laughs> and that people who show anger are um, 
you know, giving into unwholesome tendencies. Um, and although, you know, most of us know it's unpleasant to experience anger, it's unpleasant to experience jealousy or rage or, um, you know, vanity. Um, although some people kind of enjoy vanity if you look at Instagram, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, generally there is a kind of stigma attached to showing emotion in, in Buddhism, which I think has been a little bit misunderstood because not all emotions are negative and, um, emotions are just part of being human. They're part of the vagaries of human life. Emotions often arise from our unconscious. Often we can't even control them and they have to do with our thought processes and how we interpret what we're experiencing, you know? So someone who, um, and then, you know, there's the Buddhist ideal of like the person who is not too, they're very peaceful, you know, they're very compassionate and selfless. They've got their mind under control. They don't go into rages or punch people. I mean, of course it's not good to punch people, but there is a real danger that we could misinterpret um, this ideal of peace as being someone who doesn't feel anything. And for people who have a lot of anxiety and pain and then come to Buddhism and, and are told emotions are impermanent, you shouldn't let them overwhelm you or control you. Um, they often come from a place of delusion. Then it's so easy for someone who's in a lot of pain to just start spiritually bypassing, which means using spiritual ideas to, um, minimize your feelings, to minimize your needs and the needs of others. Um, and to just kind of bliss out and zone out and not really deal with authentic lived experience, um, and not meet the normal, um, kind of processes and, and, um, achievements that are part of growing in human life, you know, um, and you'll see this sometimes uh, when you speak. There's a lot of spiritual bypassing going on. in, And, and you can see the passive-aggressive way they address anger or abuse in some Buddhist chat rooms, you know, or Buddhist centers, the way they and the way they demonize um, the, the victims of abuse rather than um, acknowledging that something wrong was done or that anger and rage or loss of faith is understandable in... Um, in those situations, you know, instead, instead they kind of, um, stigmatize the survivor of abuse. Um, so the first thing to know is, you know, there's nothing wrong with having emotions and having em feeling emotions is, uh, normal and healthy. And we need to accept our emotions and not shame ourselves. Um, but just because we experience emotions doesn't mean we should act always act on them you know, because sometimes we just feel really frustrated with our partner and, you know, we just want to thump them, but that's really not the best thing to do or our child, you know, we can feel emotions, but we shouldn't always act on them. Cert certainly in the, mo in the heat of the moment when we have flight or fight response. And just because we feel our emotions doesn't always mean we're right. You know, we may feel uh, angry with our partner, but maybe they didn't do anything wrong. Maybe it has to do with our own our own issues. And that's why we need to take time to, um, carefully work through our emotions so that we're not projecting onto other people. We have to develop what we call self-regulation. And this goes into what I was talking about last week about how we raise children, um, how we, 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 we learn to soothe our children and to not shame them for having feelings. And when a child is held in their emotions, they learn to self-soothe and as they grow, they learn to emotionally self-regulate and they don't develop the, un the um, kind of deviation from healthy emotional attachment. Like they develop a secure emotional attachment. But as I discussed last week, half of people develop avoidant um, attachment patterns or uh, anxious attachment patterns because they weren't soothed and they didn't have a caregiver who could meet them and make and, and hold their emotions and, and meet their needs and connect with them. So, um, but you know, the, the good thing is that we can learn to emotionally self-regulate. We can learn to feel our feelings without being overwhelmed by them. Um, and I used to, I used to think, that I was feeling my feelings. Um, but 
a lot of stuff happened to me early on in my life, you know, heavy stuff like uh, being a street kid, being raped, um, you know, infidelity, all kinds of things, poverty um, that I wasn't dealing with, you know, and I just, I used Buddhism to bypass all of those issues to try and, you know, gain a sense of um, control over the the pain I was in basically. And, and I think it's okay now and then to just um, do a little bit of connect with the ultimate, you know, that's okay. Like we all need that. Some people use drugs for that. Some people use relationships for that. Some people use sport for that. Like they, they just need to feel good, you know, otherwise they have this overwhelming despair. So I don't think I'm not saying drugs is okay, but I, I'm just saying it's not always a bad thing. It's like a survival mechanism that we use to bypass, you know, it's like more than we can deal with. So we put it aside until we can. And sometimes it's not a bad thing for people to connect with something blissful, something wonderful, something greater than themselves. You know, it maybe gives them the strength, the refuge, the resilience they need to then come back later on and deal with these messy negative emotions. But if someone tells you that the spiritual path is all blissful emotions, uh, is all bliss and no emotions, they're lying to you. <laughs> and if they tell you you're suddenly going to become this peaceful person who gets it together, who never gets angry, who never says anything negative, they're also lying to you and they're lying to themselves. <laughs> you know, the most uh, deeply spiritual people I know are authentic, you know, and they acknowledge the paradox of human existence, the messiness, the pain. Um, as well as the joy, as well as the altruism. You know, it's about getting real with the compost of life, with the messy stuff, because the compost, the messy stuff, our wounds is where the light comes in. Our compost is where we grow the roses of insight. So, you know, sometimes someone um, destroys our trust and we flee from emotion. Um, we can't face the fear of that of that. Uh, of those painful emotions, that lo loss of trust, you know, or maybe there's a lot of feelings we're not feeling. I know it's certainly the way men are conditioned. I'm not saying all men, I'm just saying them, some men, they're ashamed as even as, as young boys, they're shamed for having emotions, you know? So it's actually harder for them as they grow up to um, be vulnerable and share emotions and to tap into probably a lot of tears and a lot of stuff that needs to be processed. Um, and they, you know, we wear a mask of, oh, everything's fine. You know, when underneath it's like, God, I, <laughs> I want to, we're, we're feeling something very different, you know. Um, and, or, or otherwise, if we're in a lot of pain, we might become cynical because we're afraid to face the rawness of life. Um, and sometimes, you know, even it leads to insomnia. Um, all the emotions that we haven't processed. Um, also, another thing people do is like they try to stay extremely busy. Sorry, I'm just moving the other camera. Um, they, yeah, they try to stay extremely busy so they don't have to deal with their emotions. But it always comes back to them. And it comes back sometimes in unhealthy habits. You know, for example, self-medicating with alcohol, um, you know, doing doing dangerous things, you know, just to kind of numb the pain. Um, and also, you know, we, we, when we are not allowing ourselves, cause we feel ashamed of those feelings. Sometimes we feel like this doesn't match my self image. This doesn't match who I think I am. So I can't be allowed to feel this way. Certainly when you're on the spiritual path and you're feeling overwhelming rage or overwhelming jealousy and you're like, I'm a Buddhist nun, I'm not meant to feel this way. <laughs> you know, I've been practicing meditation loving kindness meditation for five years. Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel this resentment? Um, so we, you know, we bottle up or we suppress, but when we suppress emotion, we're also, um, we're also dumbing down our mind. We're making our life quite boring and we're not growing from the wealth of, uh, emotional experience that we have to process. You know, we're not becoming joyful. Our life, we get depressed a lot of uh, unexpressed anger is, you know, depression. But it's also maybe sometimes a sense of um, we haven't worked out the meaning of our life, you know. But sometimes it can be that we're not allowing ourselves to experience a painful feeling. You know, sometimes another thing that we do to 
avoid feeling rage, avoid feeling painful feelings, uh, is we get angry because it's easier to get angry than it is to feel the pain that's underneath. But when you feel the pain that's underneath, you can heal and you can transform and you also don't alienate people. Um, ideally, you know, a supportive society is one in which uh, the difficulties of being human are warmly recognized and welcome and, um, you know, kindly accepted. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh says love is understanding. Without understanding, there can be no true love. When we understand that everybody is the result of social, spiritual, psychological, cultural conditions, uh, we, can under, we can understand why they are the way they are. We may not condone their behavior, but we can't hate them. We can't other them because we know what has led to them being where they are. doesn't mean they're not responsible for their actions um, or that we accept abuse, but it just means we understand. We understand why they are and we can try and, you know, help them change. Um yeah, and to face those painful feelings, those, those kinds of uncertainty, that anxiety, that flight or fight response, especially early if we were shamed as a child for having certain emotions, like um, maybe sexuality was shamed, the expression of sexuality in our, in our early teen years, or, you know, talking about emotions was shamed in the family, uh, or anger was shamed, then we feel a lot of anxiety about expressing these things, you know. So having good friends, good therapists can help with that. Um, yeah, and, and in meditation, there is, there is this kind of good kind of chain that's put aside where we can examine uh, challenging emotions, you know. We can examine the causes and when we examine the, we go beyond the storyline, we examine the basic feeling underneath, that can also be really, really useful. You know, we put down our defenses. And that's why therapy is also very useful when you find a therapist you can trust because uh, you can, you know, you can be honest with yourself, basically. And sometimes um, just someone there holding your hand to do that because <laughs> you're not always who you think you are. Um, and the power of raw emotions can be overwhelming. You know, um, that's why it's not good to act in the heat of the moment. It's not good to act in that flight or fight response. Um, you know, we might feel that we need to leave our job or we need to leave our partner. But if that is the case, we still will feel that way tomorrow. We don't need to do it immediately unless we're in danger of abuse. You know, if, unless uh, we're emotionally being abused or physically being abused. So it's good to, you know, process your emotions, feel your feelings without acting out or without suppressing. Um, and sometimes, yeah, acting in the heat of the moment just makes things worse. Um, yeah. And also just, you know, the, in the heat of the moment, the logic of our emotions isn't always... Um, sorry, somebody's admitting... Yeah, in the heat of, of the moment, our emotions are not always uh, correct either. You, our, our logic is not always correct. Um, but, you know, we can allow ourselves to feel what we feel without... Um, oh, dear, people are dropping in and out. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we can allow ourselves to feel what we feel, but we don't have to act on it. Yeah. So that's kind of imp an important thing to know. Like we can feel angry there's, and there's no shame in that, but we don't always have to act on it. Um, but what we do over time is we, we make use of the information that that anger is providing us. Like are we being abused? Is something being triggered from childhood? What is the, you know, what is the, the, problem, the problem here? Uh, what is the trauma here? And, you know, also working through the body. How does the body feel? What is the emotion in the body? And every time we can sit with an emotion, bring it up, name it, feel it in our body. What does it feel like in my body? What is this? Just sit with it. You just allow yourself to feel. You're developing an emotional regulation. And, uh, you know, you may make use of that 
information over time, you may realize, okay, I need therapy or, okay, my partner's being abusive or, okay, I have trauma um, or, gee, I really like baking bread, <laughs> you know, like you just make use of that. Um, but when, when you can feel your feelings without being completely uh, overwhelmed by them, um, you can, you can uh, heal, you can begin to heal you can begin to see them arise, abide, and dissolve. You know, you can process them, and you develop emotional self-regulation. Um, yeah, so often when we're triggered, when past trauma is triggered, there's this tendency to just want to run, this flight or fight response. Um, and that's the time where it's good to just sit, you know, just sit and go into a place where you feel safe, just sit and what's going on in my feelings, what's going on in my body, what is the, uh, what is the sensation of the carpet on my feet, you know, just kind of calm down and then once the flight or fight response is gone, you can see what's underneath that. Um, yeah. So, you know, there are many ways that we might deal with difficult emotions because sometimes it's just, it's just not an easy habit to learn to sit with dis-ease. It's not an easy, it's an acquired habit, especially if you, um, if you had a parent who always said, um, who always tried to distract you, like, um, like, oh, when, whenever you cried, your parent was like, Oh, you know, look at the teddy bear. Look at the teddy bear. Let's go for a walk. You know, like you were basically told your emotions um, are not okay. So we're going to do something else. We're going to distract you. You know, whereas if you had a parent who could just hug you and hold you in your emotion, you, you kind of learned that to feel that emotion was okay. So, you know, sometimes things we've been painful feelings, betrayals that we've been um, not processing for a long time. The way we deal with that might be, um, you know, drinking too much, binge eating, super busyness, um, seeking reassurance from others, um, random hookups, self-harm, like cutting, um, drug use. I'm not saying that everyone who smokes pot is, <laughs> is traumatized, but I'm just saying there's a lot of people who are numbing themselves, numbing their pain, numbing their trauma through... Um, misusing you know drugs um but that's only um, a short-term measure you know sooner or later we have to feel the feeling um and what does it mean to face a st disturbing emotion you know acknowledge it accept it sit with it and let it pass on its own it's kind of like a crying baby you know um at first when you have a crying baby you feel anxious and you feel like, why, why, <laughs> why me? Why? I don't want to feel this way. Why is this baby crying? But after a while, you're like, well, the baby's crying, so I've got to deal with it, you know? So you check, okay, does the baby need its nappy change? Does it need a bottle? Does it have gas? And then once all those things are fixed, you just hold it with loving kindness and the pervasiveness of your own love and acceptance relaxes the baby and it feels soothed and it stops crying. Um, or... If you're um, a new mother and you don't know why the baby won't stop crying, go to an elder. The elder in this case would be a therapist or someone with more emotional intelligence than you. <laughs> um, but sooner or later, all our crying babies uh, have, to be dealt, have to be dealt with. And, and the longer we leave them, the crying baby of our trauma, the crying baby of our age, the crying baby of our um, low self-esteem, the longer we leave them, the more wounded they become. And the more entrenched our unhealthy ways of avoiding them or acting out, because it's just so much easier to kind of verbally abuse someone else and make it their problem than it is to feel our own pain, isn't it? But, you know, in the long term, that can be very damaging. That can be alienating. That can be painful. Um, yeah, and we're not bad for having emotions. We're not bad for feeling angry. It's just part of being human. But the, the question is, do we say, okay, should I act on this? No. Um, ha, ha, why? And, you know, over time, as you feel it, it kind of just reintegrates back into your system. 
Um, you might be angry because your boundaries were some your boundaries were crossed. You know, it's not always that net anger is is just an unwholesome thing, or you might have a narcissistic tendency that needs to be addressed. You might have a a kind of um, your emotion, your jealousy, your rage might be based on the idea that you own somebody else or that they should do what you say, in, in which case it's kind of the, that point of view which is problematic, you know. Um, but see it, where is it in your body, and, and start to work with it, start to unlock it. That's why things like yoga, like body work, um, somatic therapy can also be very useful. I think meditation does help. Meditation just gives us a little space between our thoughts and feelings. And also meditation shows you that the basic, there is a basic goodness there. It gives you a source of refuge and peace that gives you the strength and the courage to, to allow this crap to come up and not be overwhelmed. You know, like I am not my suffering. I have suffering. I am not my anger. I have anger. That's the difference. You see, I'm not bad for having anger. My anger will pass you know, and, and to learn to be kind, to, to have self-compassion. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, how we pay attention to the emotion determine how, how it affects us. Like if we have a crying child and we shame the crying child, you're a bad child for crying. You just want too much of my energy. Then the child is going to act out more and demand more because we're not paying attention. We're not giving them the comfort they need, you know? Um, yeah, so when, when we breathe with our emotions, when we sit with our emotions, we can heal old wounds and resolve old baggage. Um, and we can also learn about, um, setting boundaries, self-soothing. We can learn more about ourselves, you know, and what we most deeply value, uh, and the kind of people we want to have in our lives, the kind of the kind of people we admire, the kind of morals we want to live by, what is important to us. All, our liberation is tied in with our, um, our pain, our wounds. Our wounds are a profound kind of medicine. And that is why we do need to work with emotion and we shouldn't shame people for having emotion. Um, but people are still responsible for their own, you know, for their own feelings and their own actions. Um, and we do have to start with ourselves. But the more we work with our own pain, the more we process our own feelings, um, the more capacity and equanimity we have to hold space for others. And, you know, when you listen to others, just offer them the gift of listening. Don't uh, shame them. Don't offer advice. Don't interrupt. Um, of course, it's okay if someone is quite so, you know, if s someone is quite self-centered and it's a bit hard to listen to them. It's okay to set a boundary like, okay, my friend, I have 10 minutes for you today. I have half an hour for you today. And then in the end to just try and help them come to their own conclusion, you know, like, so what I'm, and just mirror back to them. So what I'm hearing you saying is da, 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 da. In this situation, what do you think the best thing you could do? And sometimes you, you can't fix it. You know, sometimes you just have to sit with it and allow other people to sit with it. You know, there's no... Uh, the mind and the heart is not like a mechanical thing that you just, uh, you get the right wrench and it's fixed. <laughs> you know, like that's why sometimes I found um, my, ma my male friends are a little bit like, uh, okay, we just need to do this and we'll fix it and it'll be right, you know. But it, it's, it's a little more complex than that, right? These kind of things can take years. You know, you might feel a sense of loss or sadness for years and that's okay. Uh, but you keep living in the meantime, you keep gardening, you keep doing yoga, you keep delivering meals on wheels, you know, you, you keep doing what you value. And uh, yeah, I think meditation, as I said before, can be useful because it just, it just gives us a bit of space. And we start to see that maybe our mind is a bit like a really crowded room, you know, it's got too many, um, too much junk in it. And we feel at dis, not at ease because our mind has too many things that we haven't acknowledged, that we haven't worked through. But, you know, in meditation, if at first you see I'm a mess, that's okay because that's the beginning of the path. That's the beginning of realizing uh, how you can improve and what your potential is, you know, just a process of sweeping away the dust. 
but not feeling that uh, emotions or trauma is something that you can just throw away, you know, or you can throw yourself away. It, it happens in its own timeline. You can't, um, you can't force these things. I mean, you can assist. You can assist by feeling, acknowledging, uh, not trying not to hold on too tight, especially not holding on to the storyline of, of course, you know, when someone cheats on us or abandons us or abuses us, we feel so pain, so much pain. But when we're going, when we're building up the storyline in our head, like how could they do this to me? Um, it doesn't help to hold on too much. But sometimes we just can't, we, however much we want to, we can't let go. <laughs> there are people, usually people who are highly intelligent. Also, I found that um, no matter what, how much you tell them, try not to think too much. They just can't. They just, they're an anxious kind of person. And um, I have a family member like this. And like, no matter how much I've told them over the years, you know, follow your breath, let go. They can't. They, they're just they're just not wired that way. So what I found for someone like that, who's really addicted to overthinking and very anxious is, uh, get into your body, do dancing, you know, join a yoga class, join a drumming class, um, get some perspective, visit an Indian slum, you know, for those people getting into their body is, is a very healthy thing because the body doesn't lie. The head, it's not always as you think it is, you know, the head can, um, put blinders on you and stop you from seeing the infinite marvelous complex picture of life um, but the body the body is much more earthy and it's good to ground and connect with the earth and go into nature especially for those overthinker types so I think I've probably um, spoken enough about about this um, yeah, I mean, of course, according to Buddhism, it's not good to have a lot of rage and narcissism and these emotions make us suffer, but we have to be kind. I think we can't just cut them off like with a big machete, a big knife, you know, you have to, um, acknowledge your wounds before you can heal them. The pus has to come out and we have to say, well, this happened to me. Um, how am I going to break the cycle of violence so I don't pass this on to my children? I wasn't parented well. How will I change this? Although you, you realize like the world is sometimes cruel, you know, and you say you could become bitter and cynical and say, well, nobody can be trusted. Nobody's there for me. Nobody cares about me. Um, I could certainly say that having gone through what I've gone through in my life. Um, or you could say, well, this happened to me. How will I break the cycle so that that violence that exploitation does not continue into the lives of others so you know for myself I tried to change the storyline you know I tried to become the hero of my own story instead of the victim I started a girl's home so that what was done to me the sexual abuse the exploitation uh, was not passed on so I did something to flip the script doesn't mean I don't have the trauma there um, and what I tried to do was not just talk about what is wrong with um, the particular kind of people that abuse me, but to talk about what is a, po a positive uh, masculinity or not just blame, but also seek positive solutions, you know, because people, um, pe people who are abused are suffering as well, you know, or they're, or they're, they're deluded or confused. Um, I'm not saying that we should just have um, more compassion for the abuser than the victim either. Um, but I'm just saying there are ways that we can change. We can change, and that's a good thing. We can make the world a better place, you know. And I do believe in the goodness of humanity, even if there are a whole bunch of shitty people in the world. Otherwise, I can't keep living, so I just have to see the good <laughs> and be the good. Um, yeah, so does... Does anyone have any uh, any questions or things they want to discuss? Just kind of put up your hand if you want to, and I'll unmute you, or you can unmute yourself. Hello, Elizabeth. <laughs> Does anyone want to discuss anything? How did you start this journey? Um, uh, you know, I think my spiritual path, I, I wanted to be a Christian nun when I was really young. I watched The Sound of Music and I thought she, you know, looking, running over the hills and 
um, looked like a lot of fun. She was a Christian nun in Austria. And I didn't think she should have married that dude, Captain Von Trapp. <laughs> she should have just kept running over the hills. And, you know, so I think I was interested in the spiritual life very early on. But my father died when I was 14, and that's probably when it really got real. Um, I started questioning, you know, my father died, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. What is, if I could die at any time, what is the meaning of my life? And um, how can I be happy? Because I was kind of suicidal at that point. And I was uh, living on the street. So I, I basically left home in search of the meaning of life. And I went to India when I was 17. And then I found Buddhism. I tried a lot of different things like drugs, relationships, rock and roll. Um, but Buddhism kind of made the most sense. But I do, I do see now that I see the, the Buddhism can also be, can be used in a good way or or a bad way you know the spiritual bypassing is a problem and you know there are structural problems in buddhism like any community like any tradition but i try to take the good and address the bad yeah does anyone else have any other questions i hope that could you further define spiritual bypassing you could always unmute yourself and and ask a big question as well i don't mind but um it's good if you go like this first Define spiritual bypassing. Um, uh, yeah, like I said, I think it's uh, <clears throat> it's all the BS in spiritual communities where people pretend they don't have real feelings, they don't have real problems, they won't acknowledge real world realities like racism, sexism, poverty, uh, patriarchy, um, all of those things, emotions, messy emotions. They're just trying to pretend that I'm fine, you're fine, and everything is um, an illusion and, you know, they're not addressing those messy things, those messy emotions. Um, They're not looking at their own shadow, their own darkness. And because they don't look at their own shadow and their own darkness, it's more likely that abuse will manifest in those communities because there's so much idealism. There's so much idealism in Tibetan Buddhism, the reification of the guru as this enlightened, perfect person. It's such a such a setup for abuse, really. If someone is saying they're perfect, you know, I would never say as a Buddhist teacher I'm perfect. I I, I very much acknowledge I have flaws, <laughs> and I'm very scared any time anyone wants to put me on a pedestal <laughs> because I don't want that responsibility. <laughs> Take responsibility for your own spiritual growth. I messed up. I can only, um, you know, offer you a little bit of uh, friendship on the way. Hold a little lamp on your path. Um, yeah, but it's basically bypassing the stages of life and emotions and the shadow and not addressing real world realities or oppression and dismissing other people's concerns, emotions, darkness, difficulties, and just kind of talking only about the love and the light. Um, and there's nothing wrong with talking about the love and the light, but it has to incorporate emotion morality, acknowledging problems, being real and not using spiritual ideas to bypass those issues. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Do you want, you want to unmute yourself or you? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, I know you spoke last time about um, how to raise kids, so I might be asking a question you've already asked last time. But you said like, if you hold the child and be there for the child when it, when it, when the child is in the emotion. So many people think if I give the space for the child to be in that emotion, they will start using me or the parent to me and misusing this. You know how I mean it? They will be going into this tantrum. Or, or, or be going into the negative emo- negative emotion mm. to get the um, attention. To the, the attention, that's it. Yeah. To get the attention. And so then they get into the habit of using this. And there's lots of fear with parents with this. Yeah. So as baby, I know because when I was a fresh mother the first time, it was like, you must not go to the child when it's crying because it's going to get into the habit of crying and getting the attention. So we were taught to leave the child. Mm. 
So how do you, how is your intake on that? And um, how to deal with, with children? Or, or is it just, do you need to be patient and just work with and allow the child to be, even if you're feeling that you are being sucked at? So yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. I don't pretend to be an, an expert on this because I've only helped raise children. I haven't actually had them 24-7, which is so hard and makes you feel so crazy. That's why it's so exhausting because really they do want, it's almost like they're just sucking the life out of you, you know, like they really want attention and they're relentless. Um, but babies cannot communicate their needs. I think it very much depends on the age of the child. Like when it's a toddler and they're having a tantrum because they can't, they can't have a packet of chips, I think then with the child you can try to reason with them and you can try to verbalise what they're going through. Like, okay, darling, I understand you, you're upset because you want the chips, but we've already discussed you can have the chips after lunch, you know, and just be okay and let them – you don't have to kind of give them – cave into their every desire because they're a toddler and they don't know what's good for them, you know, but you also acknowledge this is what's going on and it's okay. Do you feel sad? That's okay. I'm here. You know, you don't give them what they want if it's not good for them, but you try to let them know that you're there and that it's not like you're abandoning them because that's what it can feel like when you're a toddler and you're in the middle of a big tantrum. You just let them know you're there for you. I'm here for you. You're feeling upset. You try to verbalize what they're feeling. You, you put a name to the feeling and then they feel empathized with because they don't know. Children, certainly below the age of five, can't really emotionally regulate on their own. So they need, they need when they see someone acknowledging how they feel, it's kind of letting them know that it's okay. Doesn't mean that you have to hug them every time they have a tantrum. Just says, okay, you, is this what you're feeling? That's okay. But as a baby, like below one year, when they cry, I think they definitely need to be held and they definitely need to be acknowledged, you know, because they can't communicate, they can't verbalise what they want and what they need. And they're having all kinds of feelings and emotions that they can't understand, you know. So you try to, obviously, you meet the child's need, like what it is. I don't think children cry for no reason, apart from perhaps like a toddler who wants some attention or maybe they're tired, you know, but I don't think they do it for, for absolutely no reason at all. You know, they, they, I don't think they're inherently trying to make your life hell. They just, um, they can't verbalize what they need, you know, and you just have to be really patient. And there, I think I, I can totally understand that there would be times where you're just like, you know, we're just going to go for a walk now. Um, <laughs> And if you keep crying, that's okay, but I need a walk, <laughs> you know, or I'm just going to have a coffee now. I totally understand that, you know, that you can't capitulate to their every need, but I think you, they do need to feel that you're there for them. And I, I don't like, I think this, um, this thing of leaving babies to cry was a, is a kind of a 1970s child rearing technique, which a lot of psychologists now have dismissed as not so great. I'm not that old. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But how old are the books you've been reading? <laughs> oh, okay. so those were midwives and all those people who were who, who help you do the time with the baby sits. I don't know what the books they were reading, but that was very much, very, very much when I, I was having kids as babies, they very much told you to get to five. Mm. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that, but... No, As a mother of four kids, you probably know better than me. Um, this is just what I've gathered over time. Like we, we used to have this little nun. Um, she had a very traumatic, we took these two little nuns. I'm not a fan of child ordination, right? But these, these children were growing up in a very dangerous slum and their mother was working a, a full-time job e often into the evening. And these girls were like um, seven and nine years old. And they could have been raped. They could have been kidnapped um, in that slum. They weren't in a good environment, you know. So we wanted to keep them safe. And um, so we agreed to take them as an exception because generally children are better off with their parents unless the parents are abusive. But um, as an exception, we took – normally we only take girls above 14 into our girls' home. 
But we took these girls because they were in a very dangerous situation. And when the kids first came to us, they were just crying all the time, but especially the small one. She would just like, if one of the wardens left her alone, she would just go into cr- like screaming. Like it was crazy. And it was so hard to deal with. We all felt terrible. We felt like we were the people who'd ripped her away from her mother and we were abusers. And it just made us all feel so rotten. And at first we just kind of were like, oh yeah, we give her a hug. And she just kept crying and crying. And like, it went on for days, you know, like the warden would leave the room and the little girl would start to cry and scream, you know? And, um, at first, like after a few days of this, we just were like, this is so unbearable. Um, and we were like, what are we going to (laughs) do? And at first we were like, you know, trying to bribe her with some sweets or, um, trying to threat, you know, even we got to the point where we're so desperate. We're like, just be quiet or we'll, we'll smack you or, you know, cause it's in India. That's just the way they talk to children, unfortunately, you know, or we were like, you just got to stop this. Just pull yourself together. You know, no one's going to hurt you. And I just spoke to a, a counselor friend of mine. I'm studying counseling now. And my counseling friend said something really useful. She said, this child is very small. She's lost her primary caregiver she's not able to, she's in despair. She's not able to regulate her own emotions. Just be patient with her, have a bit of compassion, understand she can't regulate and just let her cry and be stable with her, show her love, be patient with these feelings and they will go away over time. And that's exactly what happened. We showed her love and affection and care. We drew pictures with her. We comforted her. Um, We you know, like made her part of the community. And over time, those children have become very well adjusted, very happy, very much integrated into our little girl's home, you know. So it was just the case that we needed to just be present with those those feelings for her. And she adjusted. Because children, that's the good thing, you know, children are um, malleable. They They can create new pathways, neural pathways. And I think it's really interesting with teenagers as well, you know, because people think teenagers are hell, like, because, you know, they're just so bitchy and like, oh, yeah, like they're so they talk back and they're so ungrateful. And um, and you're just like, oh, my God, you know, what a nightmare. What have I done to deserve this? You know, but actually, when you know scientifically what teenagers are going through, they have like almost twice as many hormones as the average person. They're going through a massive growth spurt their brain is not fully formed. It's laying down massive pathways. It's like chaos, you know? So because of the hormones, all the feelings are like twice as strong. The neural pathways, it's very confused. You don't have it. You're testing boundaries, you know? So rather than getting irritated, just be calm and set firm boundaries about what's okay and what's not, you know, because they'll test those boundaries and they're trying to lay down a sense of identity of how they fit into society. And that's why it's such a shame that we don't have rites of passage for teenagers to teach them what is the responsibilities of a good human being, what is, who deserves to be called an adult, you know, what do you contribute to the tribe as an adult, what is your rite of passage, what is an ideal man, what is healthy masculinity, what is healthy femininity, or, you know, non-binary, whatever you happen to be. Um... But when I, you know, when I understood like what is going on with teenagers physically, psychologically in their body, you know, even just have a conversation with them about that. Like this is what is happening in the bodies of teenagers. These are all the, um, all the, the hormones and the emotions, you know, and just look it up online. Like this is what you're going through. So how do you, how's that going for you? You know, how does that feel? And just be patient, you know, cause it will pass. And eventually they'll, um, maybe one day when they're 25 or 30, they'll be grateful to you. <laughs> but in the meantime, they're just going to be really ungrateful. <laughs> so. No, I don't. I, I, I have grateful children. <laughs> I'm blessed. <laughs> At least you don't have crying babies. You're over that stage now with the crying babies. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else have any other questions before we finish? Nope. Um, I do. Yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, with the anger, um, sometimes it's like opening a tap when you have anger. It just does a, you know, just continue. Um, explain it. Sometimes I find not dealing with anger, like not expressing anger is easier than opening up that. Um, that roaring sea inside. 
yeah, sort of, I don't know how to explain it well. Um, but how do you manage sort of channeling your anger and all sort of... Um, it's a challenge. Way that that's not going to explain. Yeah. Or you say something that you shouldn't say to somebody. Sometimes as women, we're also very invested in um, not upsetting anyone, you know, and not making people uncomfortable, um, like keeping the peace, you know, and not saying something very difficult. Like, for example, I told a guy a while back who um, slept with me when I was 15 and I said, he was 25 and he should have known better. And I said, you know, that, that wasn't really appropriate. That's like statute. That's like grooming, grooming a girl who's not ready, who's, who's still a child, really. Um, I didn't accuse him of anything. I just said, you know, maybe looking back, it may not have been a great thing to do and it had an emotional effect on me. And he just got so angry and, you know, completely full of rage and blame. And, and what I've realised is um, not everyone is going to be your friend you know, and sometimes where you have to say something that wasn't right, uh, you have to be prepared that maybe that relationship will fall apart. But if it falls apart, it means that that person isn't really invested in having a healthy, healing, supportive relationship with you, you know, because I actually told another man who also did that to me when I was young. And he just said, I'm really sorry. I was also very immature myself. And, and that was it. We dropped it. We're still friends. But, but that other guy, he couldn't acknowledge. Um, he was too invested in being this spiritual figure to acknowledge that maybe he'd done something wrong because he didn't like what that showed him about himself. He couldn't face his own shadow. Um, and I think perhaps sometimes we have to be ready for, to be honest in a relationship. Um, if you're being honest and you're not blaming, like this is what I felt, you're not saying this is your fault, you're just saying this is what I felt. Um, sometimes those relationships may may go through a period where you're not talking to each other, you know. And it's also very hard if the person you're trying to bring up these issues with is very old and set in their ways and you know they're not going to hear you and you know they're not going to change. So in that case, it may be better to go to a therapist and try and work through these feelings on your own because you know you won't get closure from that person and you know it would probably upset everybody else in the family and maybe they're not ready to deal with it. But you, you may also realise that um, it's better to avoid this person, you know, that, that they can't change. It really depends on what the circumstances are, you know. But I do think therapy helps, and I think allowing yourself to feel angry, but feeling it in your body, you know, what does it feel like in my body? Um, and understanding, like, especially if it happened when you were a child, you couldn't control it. It wasn't something you did wrong. It wasn't your fault. It was the actions of that person, you know, and, and to not feel ashamed. Sometimes the, there's a feeling of the pain and the helplessness because you couldn't change it. You couldn't change it. That's the really, often below the rage is, is a sadness, is a loss, is a pain, you know, connecting with that. When you connect with the pain that's underneath the anger, you know, that's when it starts to heal. And I'm not, you know, I'm quite outspoken. Sometimes I do lash out, you know, and sometimes... Um, I actually, sometimes in a healthy way and sometimes in an unhealthy way. But I, I'm so tired of lying about um, abusive women, abusive children, unhealthy emotions, all kinds of stuff, all the stuff we hide in Buddhism, you know, trying to keep, look good on the outside. I'm just, I think it's actually very, it, it perpetuates abuse, you know. And it's something we have to start talking about. Like Me Too, Me Too absolutely had to happen. Um, for, for men to understand what women live with. And also, we also need to look at how, um, how society pushes men into unhealthy patterns of expressing emotion and the suffering they have because of that, you know, the, the mental health crisis men are having because of patriarchal standards of rigidity and, you know, the lone wolf and all of that nonsense that makes them so unhappy, you know, because men have emotions, men need to need to be vulnerable and supported as much as anyone yeah but I think just allowing yourself to be angry and um but also looking you know working in the body 
working with a bit of yoga, working with a bit of therapy and not feeling ashamed and not allowing, you don't have to be the one in the family who um, keeps the peace because you weren't the one who did the abuse, you know. Like why? I mean, I do get angry. Sorry to interrupt. I do mm. get angry. Mm. I mean, sometimes I say things and then I regret. Yeah. Um, you know, you can only be braided so much and then finally you just explode totally. and then you feel like yeah. you feel so bad sometimes when you explode. Uh, explode. Yeah. <laughs> and you can only try again next time to, do, to deliver it in a better way. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes someone is never going to be able to receive what you're saying because they're still in a very narcissistic, deluded space or an entitled space. You know, there are literally men who just don't think that they, that women should be able to speak back to them. Um, you know, they're, they're so entitled to their abuse, you know. Even women, there are, there are people with narcissistic personality disorder. There are people who are just very messed up and can't receive the effect they have on others. So you have to start in your own practice, working with your own anger, you know, like thinking about what happened to you as a kid and bringing up those feelings and sitting with them, you know, so that they won't build up into a rage next time you're triggered. You have to start exploring and talking about what happened to you as a child, you know, and, and, and I do think therapy helps with that. Yeah. But it's, it's an ongoing process to acknowledge our, uh, our emotions, our feelings, so that they don't build up and, and to look into our trauma, you know. And to learn better ways of processing emotion and regulating ourselves. So I'm in Australia. Tamara is in Germany. Milanka is in Sydney. Minakshi, I'm not sure where she is. Marie Vidra is in Mexico. Not sure about Marie and Minakshi. Yeah. Colorado is pretty beautiful, I've heard. Yeah. Melbourne. Windy. Does anyone else have any other comments or questions before we finish? Okay, very good. Thank you for coming. I'll probably see some of you next week. May you all be happy and well. And if you can offer a $10 or more donation for this, I appreciate it because this is how I survive as a nun. Um, but if you can't, I understand and all the best. And the donations are on the Facebook page, the website. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>